on the 30th of January 1649, with the swing of an executioner's axe, the King of England had his head taken clean off for his crimes in front of a huge crowd in London. King Charles I is remembered for being the terrible Stuart King, who is responsible for the English Civil War, and because of this he was brought to trial by Parliament. He had many enemies, but the King's most formidable, Oliver Cromwell, would be a leading force pushing for the King's execution, but this was one of the most shocking moments in history, as the King of England would be found guilty of treason against his own people. The execution of the King was felt for years after, and following the restoration of the monarchy, the late King's son would invoke vengeance against those responsible for his father's death, and he would order the remains and dead bodies of Cromwell and other leading figures behind the execution of Charles I to be dug up and then paraded through London, when they were then hacked to pieces by an executioner. But what is the story of King Charles I's execution and the circumstances that led to this? To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Charles was born in November 1600 and he was the second son of James I of England and his mother was Anne of Denmark. At the age of five he would be made the Duke of York and a Knight of the Bath, but he was given a brilliant education befitting his status as a prince. He studied maths and languages, as well as religion, but Charles was a sickly child and he had a number of problems. He would wear braces for his ankles to straighten his legs and he also suffered with his confidence and had a stutter that remained with him when he became a king. His older brother Henry was the heir, and he was the spare, and the brothers were very close. Henry was much stronger, and it was hoped that one day he would reign over the nation, but at the age of 18, Henry the heir would die from suspected typhoid. With this, the 12-year-old Charles became the heir apparent, and four years later he would become the Prince of Wales. But his father, around 1624, became rather sick, and his health was getting worse, and he would leave government business in the hands of his son Charles, and on the 25th of March 1625, James I died, and Charles I then came onto the throne. This would be a reign that would go down in history, as one of the most shocking and terrible, but it was a reign that had huge consequences. Charles was proclaimed king as soon as his father died, and he would now embark along with the assistance of the Duke of Buckingham to find a wife and a queen. The pair looked at potential Spanish brides, they then looked towards France, and on the 1st of May 1625, Charles I married Henrietta Maria of France, a princess by proxy. The pair first met the month after in Canterbury, and it was a successful marriage, as the pair would have five surviving children. But there were a number of problems with the marriage. It was not supported by everyone, and Henrietta Maria was a very strong Roman Catholic, and many feared her influence over the church, and they believed her religion could cause problems across the land. Charles I tried to assure Parliament that religious restrictions upon Catholics would not be changed, despite the fact he was married to a Catholic, and the match between the King and now Queen would also result in a secret treaty that gave English ships to the French, and if knowledge of this had got to Parliament, they would have been furious. Charles I was crowned in February 1626 at Westminster Abbey, and his wife was not present, she was quite vocal in her disapproval of the Protestant coronation, and she would not support it. But as time went on there were further problems for Charles, especially as many more people became concerned about different aspects of his reign. The King's own religious beliefs were questioned, and many believed that George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham, had too much power over Charles, and Buckingham would then be assassinated. But there were also economic problems, as the cost of war was causing issues, and the king would raise taxes to pay for these. But Charles continued to argue with Parliament, and he was arrogant in his belief that Parliament should submit to him and his wishes, and he believed he had a right to rule assigned to him by God. This was known as the divine right of the kings, and he believed no one could question him at all, and whatever he said. This was of course not the case, and many believed Charles' changes to the nation were nothing short of tyrannical. He continued to be volatile, and throughout his reign, three times he would dissolve Parliament in just four years, when he argued with them, and he would then, if they came to an impasse, just get rid of Parliament. He was not willing to listen to his government, with regards to issues in his country. He introduced ship money, a tax to raise money, for the crown in which those living on the coastal regions would be required to pay more tax. 
This was a tax usually waged during times of warfare, but Charles raised his tax to get more money for himself. There were some people who would refuse to pay these, and they were often brought to court, and there were some people who were brave enough to voice their discontent against the king. But he would also bring in a number of radical religious changes, alongside the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Lord. He would crack down on Puritans and Catholics, despite his marriage, and many left to migrate to other nations, but in Scotland the English king, despite being crowned in Edinburgh, would encounter a significant amount of religious hostility. The Scots throughout the years would be known for their fierce resistance to religious changes, and the Scottish Covenanter army refused the changes, and they would be victorious in the Bishop's War. But in April 1640, the King summoned a new Parliament to try and raise further money for war. Also, there was an Irish uprising against Scottish and English Protestant settlers, which resulted in mass executions and slaughter, and it was clear that the King was now in a serious spot of bother. Tensions were also becoming very raised, and Charles would even try to arrest five members of Parliament in August 1642. This all led to the English Civil War breaking out. By August 1642, Charles I had established himself in Nottingham, and the Royal Army was gathered, and the King raised his standard there, and he declared war against Parliament. The two sides were known as the Cavaliers and the Roundheads, for their helmets, and the Civil War involved over 600 battles and sieges, and was the deadliest conflict ever fought on English soil. The first major engagement took place at the Battle of Edge Hill, and Prince Rupert the King's nephew led the Royalist cavalry, and the Parliamentarians managed to loot the baggage train of the Royalist forces. This battle resulted in much of a draw, but the King could have marched to London, but he withdrew to Oxford and made this his Royalist capital. More battles were fought in 1643, and Prince Rupert stormed Bristol and raided, then the first battle of Newbury was fought in September 1643, with 15,000 men fighting on each side, but another draw would come. Further towns and cities were besieged by each side, as were castles and fortifications. The parliamentarians allied themselves with the Scottish Covenanters, and they fought the Battle of Marston Moor in July 1644, and this was the biggest battle with 45,000 men fighting, and this was a key parliamentarian victory. Further battles came, but then Parliament reorganised their forces into what was known as the New Model Army, and what emerged was a professionally trained and led force fronted by Oliver Cromwell, a key disciplined commander who would become the King's most feared opponent. Cromwell was showing his skill on the battlefield, and the New Model Army would win battle after battle, and in 1645 the Royalists lost their key port during the Siege of Bristol. The First English Civil War, as it was known, came to an end, and the King's personal writing cabinet was captured, and it was found that he had no intention of entertaining peace talks. Further fighting would break out, and what became known as the Second Civil War occurred, and Charles was not going to relent or give up, and in summer 1648, the Siege of Pembroke, the Battle of Maidstone, and the Siege of Colchester erupted. But Cromwell was getting the better on the battlefield, and the King was captured as he fled north. He was handed over to Parliament, and he would escape his capture, and he was then sent to the Isle of Wight, and specifically to Carisbrook Castle, where he was imprisoned, and held in a small fortification, with no chance of escape. Planned Royalist uprisings broke out, but were crushed, and at the Battle of Preston in August 1648, the New Model Army won a huge victory, and Cromwell recaptured Carlisle and Berwick, and this brought the end of the Second Civil War. But with this, King Charles I was moved to different castles, and he was then brought to trial. He was indicted for treason, and many said that this was unlawful, as he was a king. The country was divided, as many believed they could not place a king on trial, as some believed, including the king, that he was above the law, with his divine right to rule. But others wanted the king to negotiate still, and the decision to place him on trial was not popular. His trial began on the 20th of January 1649, inside of Westminster Hall. He was dressed smartly, and had a black hat on his head, which he refused to take off. He was wearing clothing that indicated his power. He was accused of treason against England, and said he used his power to pursue his own interests, rather than the good of the people. Charles I was obstinate, and he claimed that, No earthly power can justly call me 
who am your king, in question, as a delinquent. This day's proceedings cannot be warranted by God's law, for on the contrary, the authority of obedience unto kings is clearly warranted and strictly commanded in both the Old and New Testament. For the law of this land, I am no less confident that no learned lawyer will affirm that an impeachment can lie against the king. They are all going in his name, and one of their maxims is that the king can do no wrong. The higher house is totally excluded, and for the House of Commons, it is too well known that the major part of them are detained or deterred from sitting. The arms I took up were only to defend the fundamental laws of this kingdom against those who have supposed my power have totally changed the ancient government. It's believed that around 6% of the whole population were killed during the English Civil War, with around 300,000 people dying. Over the first three days of the court's proceedings, Charles refused to plead, and he would state, I would know by what power I am called hither, by what lawful authority, and he continued to deny the court's power. At the end of the third day of the trial, King Charles I was removed from the courtroom, and over the next two days, 30 witnesses were heard about the king's conduct and treatment of civilians by cavalier soldiers during his war. On the 26th of January 1649, the king was condemned to death, and the death sentence of King Charles I was passed. The death sentence concluded with, This court doth adjudge that he, the said Charles Stuart, as a tyrant, traitor, murderer and public enemy to the good people of this nation, shall be put to death by the severing his head from his body. The king was not allowed to speak, and then 58 commissioners, including Cromwell, and other leading parliamentarians and enemies of the king, would sign the death warrant of Charles I. On the 27th of January 1649, the High Court of Justice upheld the death sentence, and the king spent his final days inside of St James's Palace, under arrest, awaiting his execution. He was accompanied by his loyal subjects, and he was visited by his family. He was given three days to get his affairs in order, and he was allowed to say goodbye to just two of his children, the two youngest, Henry the Duke of Gloucester, aged nine, and Princess Elizabeth, who was just eleven. Charles refused to see anyone but his children and a priest, a chaplain named Bishop Juxon. He told his children not to grieve, and said they should obey their older brother Charles, who he regarded as a lawful sovereign. Elizabeth knew this was the last time she would see her father, and she cried hysterically, and the king tried his best to hold back his own tears. He comforted Elizabeth and said, Sweetheart, you will forget this, before he bade them farewell. Charles's final moments were also spent writing final letters and burning the majority of his correspondence. But whilst this was happening, a large scaffold was being created on Whitehall in London, near to the Palace of Whitehall, at the Banqueting House. This scaffold was accessed through a window, which the king would later have to climb through, but it's likely that from the king's own rooms, he heard the building work that was taking place for the structure that would take his life. Charles spent his last night on earth restless, and he went to sleep at 2am, following dividing his jewels between his children, and he was left with only his George, the enamel figure of the St George, worn for the Order of the Garter. Charles was right not to sleep well, and he awoke early on the day of his execution, and he began to dress at 5am. He wore fine clothes, all which were black, and he wore his blue garter sash. He wanted people to remember him as a king, and he prepared himself until dawn. He would be executed in the afternoon, so this morning would have been horrific for him, waiting until the time would come where the axe would fall. Charles instructed Thomas Herbert, the gentleman of the bedchamber, as to what to do with his last possessions, and he also requested that Herbert find him an extra shirt, as it was a very cold January morning, and the king did not want to shiver, and this could be then interpreted as a sign of fear and intimidation. Herbert obtained this shirt, and the king wearing this extra layer, then spent his final few hours before the execution with his priest. He received the blessed sacrament from Bishop Juxon, and at 10am, Colonel Francis Hacker summoned the king to go to Whitehall, from St James's Palace, a short distance away, for his execution. At midday, the king drank a glass of wine, and ate some bread, but at this time the huge crowds were gathering outside the banqueting house on Whitehall, where the execution would take place.
The public were there to see the most historic execution in English history, and the scaffold had been draped and secured in black cloth, and there were even ropes passed through the scaffold to allow the king to be tied down to the executioner's block if he would not willingly submit to the executioner. The block was also very notably a very low one, rather than the other larger blocks in which someone would kneel to rest their head on before the axeman would take the swing. The low block meant the king would have to practically lie down and rest his head on it, and this was considered a lot more submissive. But the executioner and his assistants who had condemned the king were unknown, and these remained anonymous. There was a lot of problems with finding an executioner who would perform the job of killing a king, and the exact identity of this person is still to this day unknown. At 2pm, Colonel Hacker told Charles to come to the scaffold, and the king made his way through the banqueting house, and he came through a window, walking onto the wooden platform. The sight was described as the saddest sight England ever saw, when the king was on the scaffold, and Charles saw the huge crowds. There were guards stationed all around, to keep an eye on the proceedings, and he knew that they would cause a problem, if the king spoke. The king wanted to make a speech, and he spoke to Bishop Juxon and Matthew Tomlinson, who recorded his speech in shorthand. In this he said he was innocent of his crimes, and he said, You must give God his due by regulating rightly his church, according to the scripture, which is now out of order. For to set you in way particularly, now I cannot, but only this. A national synod freely called, freely debating amongst themselves, must settle this, when that every opinion is freely and clearly heard. For the king indeed I will not. Hurt not the axe that may hurt me. For the king, the laws of the land will clearly instruct you that. Therefore, because it concerns my own particular, I only give you a touch of it. For the people and truly I desire their liberty and freedom, as much as any body whomsoever. But I must tell you that their liberty and freedom consists in having of government. Those laws by which their lives and goods may be their own. It is not for having a share in government, sirs. That is nothing pertaining to them. A subject and a sovereign are clear, different things. And therefore, unto they do that, I mean, that you do put the people in that liberty, as I say, certainly they will never enjoy themselves. Sirs, it was for this that I am now come here. If I would have given way to an arbitrary way, for to have all the laws changed according to the power of the sword, I needed not to have come here. And therefore I tell you, and I pray God, it to be not laid to your charge, that I am the martyr of the people. In truth, sirs, I shall not hold you much longer, for I will say this to you, that in truth I could have desired some little time longer, because I would have put then that I have said in a little more order, and a little better digested than I have done, and therefore I hope that you will excuse me. I have delivered my conscience, I pray God, that you do take these courses that are best for the good of the kingdom and your own salvation. King Charles I said he was a martyr of the people, and he then asked Bishop Juxon to place a silk nightcap on, and this was done so the executioner would not be troubled by the king's hair. He then said he would go from a corruptible crown to an incorruptible one, and he said he would go to heaven. He then handed over his garter sash to the bishop before he readied himself for the executioner. He asked the executioner, Is my hair well? And then said to the bishop, Remember. And he then told the executioner, You must set it fast and told him when he put his hands out, stretched on the block, that would be the sign for the executioner to strike with his axe. The axe as a weapon was not considered the most reliable, when compared to a sword for example, and axemen could make their work a mess with a number of swings. But as the king laid down on the block, he would then stretch out his arms, and he would give the sign, and the executioner swung down quickly and hard, with the weapon and the axe, onto the neck of the king. Instantly the king's head was severed from his body, and the blood of the king was soaked up by the velvet and fabric on the scaffold, and guards rushed forward to dip their handkerchiefs in the blood of the king. It was common and tradition at the time for the executioner to announce the executioner to the crowd, and hold up the head of the condemned, and say, Behold the head of a traitor. But the executioner, despite holding the head of the king up to the crowd and displaying it, did not utter the words to risk being detected by his voice. He may have even at one point dropped the head into the crowd, but the king's head was then the following day sewn back onto his body, as the body would then be embalmed and be placed in a lead coffin.
The question now for the Commission and Parliament was what to do with the body of the executed King Charles I. The decision was made not to allow the King to rest in the heart of English religion inside of Westminster Abbey, as it was stated his remains stood a high chance of being dug up and being stolen and used as a royalist relic. They did not want Charles I becoming a martyr, and because of this he was taken under the cover of nightfall on the 7th of February to Windsor Castle, where he was interred inside of a vault in St George's Chapel, and inside of this vault lies King Henry VIII and his third wife Jane Seymour. The vault would be opened in the years later, and Charles I's coffin was also opened. The execution of King Charles I is seen as one of the most controversial and shocking in history, and many historians have claimed that the execution was unnecessary and was horrific. Charles himself was sober, and he was a refined character, but he was a man who was set in his ways and was driven by his divine right of the kings, which led him to being very obstinate. The reception to his execution was one which was met with a gasp and some even sighed. The monarchy would be dissolved with the swing of the axe, and later Charles's son would return from exile and restore the monarchy. But there was a significant amount of anger with the king's execution, and the story of King Charles I and his downfall is one of the most captivating in history. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.